So I want to just share a few examples of regional collaboration because adult ed is at the center of things. I think more than ever before, you're at the table um, with the right stakeholders. You're being asked to contribute the valuable services that you offer. People are thinking of you as partners. And so there are ways that different um, stakeholders are drawing in adult ed providers to support the, the larger goals that they're trying to achieve. We're working with a regional uh, collaboration called Project Grow. That's growing regional opportunities for the workforce. It has five workforce boards, five training providers who all are in community colleges, um, and, and it's focused on three student cohorts. These uh, training providers are very diverse. In some instances, uh, a couple of them have a federally funded adult ed programs that they administer at their college. Others are partnering with an external provider, and others are offering adult ed services themselves through a continuing education unit. So very diverse ways that these services are being offered. But we've asked them to take students who are in three different skill levels, which we call different cohorts, and, and target program and interventions to the students. So here's an, a very important point. There is no one size fits all. There are a number of models out there, and finding the right program intervention that best meets the needs of your particular students is important. So we divided up the lower skill adults on the Texas-Mexico border in these five board areas into to these three cohorts. The first is a group that has a GD or high school diploma, but they're not college ready. Their skill levels, if you were to tape them, um, or passes, um, would, be on, um, would be in the ninth to 12th grade level. The second group, cohort B, are, are students who don't have a GD or high school diploma, but they, their skill levels also fall in that AC, ASC level. And then the third group are, don't have a GD or high school diploma, they fall in that intermediate ABE level range, or, or they're English language learners. And the goal there is to develop these contextualized on-ramp programs that build their academic skills, build their um, English literacy skills, and help them to get a GED. For, uh, for the, high school, uh, the high school level group without a GED, the idea, the program intervention is to engage them in integrated pathways that allow them to get that GED preparation and get that credential, but they're also getting that first occupational credential as well. And then for the cohort A group that has a GED or high school diploma, they're getting a, a college readiness bridge that really is focused on helping them get to college ready so they don't have to go into dev ed and, um, and go on towards higher level um, occupational training programs within the colleges. We have employers, one-stop operators, the colleges, uh, a bunch of community-based organizations, a number of other partners involved with this who are all working together to support these programs. Um, we're, we're using technology in some interesting ways, trying to see if have it, giving students access to computer with internet access and some online supplemental instruction um, the lower level students, if that will accelerate their um, academic progress. We're also testing whether or not, <clears throat> excuse me, more intensive case management services for that lower level group will also help to accelerate their process, their progress. So um, this is going really well, um, challenging, but really well uh, work that's happening across the border. And I can share more about how, how these partnerships have come together. But that's one model where the collaboration is led by the workforce board, but they've pulled together all of these partners. Another regional collaboration, which is I'm really excited about, it's this great little project that the Dollar General Literacy Foundation um, is implementing in Ardmore, Oklahoma. Um, how many of you are familiar with the Dollar General Liter Literacy Foundation? Um, they're a great organization. Uh, all they fund is literacy. Um, they often fund smaller programs in the field. But um, they, are, they went into this community, which is pretty small. Ardmore is about 25,000 uh, residents. And they wanted to attack the issue of li literacy from multiple vantage points. So they brought in a number of national partners who are working with local partners. And they don't have you know, a lot of capacity. Um, in, um, in Ardmore, they don't have a lot of large uh, adult education providers. Many of them, uh, a couple of them are, have volunteer, uh, are volunteer-led organizations. Others are, you know, are, have instructors, but they're small. And so how do you build the capacity of this community um, to better address its literacy needs? So they brought in all of these partners that you see listed here who are all working with local partners to build out components of this approach. 
The American Library Association is helping the local library build, build itself as a hub for, uh, for innovation, for literacy uh, development, for supportive literacy programs. One of the hallmarks is they're developing a technology center and a testing center in the library that can be utilized by programs across the community to support their, um, their literacy instruction, but also to support their learners as they want to work uh, offline, outside of the classroom. The Barbara Bush Foundation for Literacy um, is actually working with some local partners to develop a family literacy program that is focused on building um, the skills and helping adult learners, often uh, single moms with children, get a GED or high school diploma while also working with their children to help raise their skill level. So that's fabulous. The Institute for a Competitive Workforce, which is a project of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, is working with the local Chamber of Commerce. And what they're doing is working with the high schools and the middle schools around getting students to grade level literacy. So we know that often after third grade, certainly after fifth grade, by high school, many students are way behind. And so these are trying to work with these, um, with these schools to help students um, increase their literacy skills through mentorship, through, um, in, and through volunteer, uh, and through professional development with, uh, uh, with the instructors. Jobs for the Future is working with a number of providers around career pathways and how to connect their services to that, and also developing partnerships with employers and with, um, with a local uh, post-secondary institution to support some training. The National Center for Families Learning is, is doing some great work around third grade reading. Um, Pro Literacy is actually working with several community-based organizations who did not previously offer literacy services and helping them to add that to their um, slate of services so that they can increase the capacity of literacy providers in the community. Um, and of course, the University of Miami is actually evaluating this effort. This is such a fabulous little project because um, it's taking all of the components of literacy that we would want to address, and it's building local capacity to address this. It's difficult. Um, but the local partners are so excited. Uh, they've achieved a lot of results already. Over 100 and I think over 150 adults have already been engaged in these programs. About 375 young people, over 5,000 instructional hours in the first nine months of this little pilot. Um, but we think it has great promise for providing a community-based approach to how, um, how to address a literacy and regional collaboration around that. And I'll just share one other example, and this is um, a number of different uh, communities, 38 in fact, that are part of something called the National Fund for Workforce Solutions, which is really focused on, on building out sector-based workforce partnerships that are employer-led. So they identify the industry sectors that have the highest employment. Um, they coalesce these employers in a network and say, tell us what you collectively want, um, what are the occupations that are in demand, what are the skills and competencies you want, and how can we help to address those. And then they coalesce the training providers and the community network, which often includes adult ed, to address the needs of those employers. And so this is happening um, in communities across the country where they're building out these partnerships and adult ed is, is uh, aligning its services to create these bridges, to create these integrated pathway programs that are meeting the needs of these employers in these key sectors. Finally, I want, well, not finally, almost finally, um, I want to talk about a couple quick other things. So one is that in addition to all of the work that's happening on the ground, there, there's a lot happening at the national level and at the state level to support this work. And so if there's one big message, it's that career pathways is not going away. It's here to stay. Um, you're going to hear more and more about it um, from the federal level. You're going to hear more and more about it at the state level as your uh, state agencies are being asked to align their plans with a career pathways. And so that means that what you do will have to be focused on career pathways as well, especially if you get any kind of state level support. And so here's just, just, these are just a few examples of some of the work that's happening. Um, across uh, the country. The Department of Education has the Advancing CTE and Career Pathways Initiative, um, which is really focused on a, a, a cross-pipeline approach. So helping states 
look at career pathways starting at, at CTE programs in high school and then building across adult ed and into college. Um, OCTE, which is the new name for OVE, the Office um, of Career and Technical and Adult Education, um, has a Moving Pathways Forward initiative that just launched. They just named 14 states, and that really will be focused on uh, connecting adult ed at the state level much more closely with career pathways that's happening at that level and then having it trickle down in terms of the work that, that's funded by those states. DOL not wanting to be left behind, um, uh, which has funded a lot of work in career pathways already, but they wanted their own TA initiative which, they, which they've just launched. Which, and, the, and the goal here is pretty um, ambitious. They want all of their formula funded grantees. That means every workforce board, every state workforce uh, commission, to be focused on linking the services that they're offering to uh, state level career pathway systems. And then um, the Health and Human Services Agency, which many of you may or may not have been in engaged with, but um, is really opening its doors and opening its eyes to how to connect TANF recipients to career pathways much more and, and looking to partner in local communities to help um, provide services and supports building on the infrastructure that you already have to support these students. So they have a couple of initiatives that are focused on family stability and pathways to careers and, um, and are also tying that to career pathways. Many of you have heard uh, a lot about the reauthorization of WIA, WIOA, uh, whatever it'll be called in the end. Um, and you know this has made um, a pretty far advancement down the path to, uh, to actually finally being um, reauthorized, there is hope that by the fall something might actually happen. We, we will all see. We all go through this every year. Um, in fact, my boss has a great slideshow. Um, she had her first child when WIA was first reauthorized. And I mean, when WIA was first authorized, she was actually at the Department of Labor. So she tracks the, the age of her child. You know, every time it's supposed to be reauthorized, she would have been five, and then she was, you know. So uh, uh, we'll see, maybe, we'll see if she gets out of high school before um, it actually happens. But if it does, um, there, there's a lot of strong language in there about aligning and strengthening the connections between adult ed uh, community colleges, post-secondary education, and workforce um, efforts. So, uh, and including starting with the state level plan. And again, if it goes in the state plan, it trickles down to everybody else. So it's not optional that Region X can't, you know, it's not just Region A decides they want to do it and Region X decides not, no. If it's in the state plan, everybody has to do it, um, and that's where the push is happening a lot more. There's also been a lot of effort um, by national policy organizations like Jobs for the Future and others to try to reinstate ability to benefit in whatever way possible. And so we've actually um, had some success thus far in getting the Senate Appropriations Committee to pass a bill that would reinstate ability to benefit for students in career pathway programs like these integrated pathways or these bridge programs that we were talking about. And for those of you who may not be familiar with ability to benefit, it was um, uh, a component of the Pell funding legislation that allowed students without a GD or a high school dip a diploma to access Pell grants if they could demonstrate that they could pass two college level classes or pass uh, a comprehensive exam. And many institutions across the country were able to help students successfully pass two college credit level courses. And then they were able to get financial aid to con continue their occupational training. Now they have to have a GED or high school. That was removed a few years back. And so they have to have a GED or high school diploma before they can then get any kind of federal financial aid um, for occupational training. Uh, sometimes state. Um, funding sources will, will cover some of the tuition and fees, although often they're aligned with the federal regulations. And so, you know, this is a huge burden on, on our students to try to come up with these resources to pay for this training. So even if we can get it back in a limited way and then really document its success, it opens the door for us to, to say bring it back all together. And so we're fighting really, really hard and hope that um, it'll pass out of the Senate and then um, you know, hopefully the House will take it up as well. And these TACT grants, these Trade Assistant Act 
community college career training grants, um, and DLL is not known for its short uh, program titles, uh, but these grants have also created real opportunities to bring in adult ed partners as these community colleges are trying to develop programs that meet the need of trade impact workers. These are folks who have been laid off because of foreign competition. Um, their, their employers, you know, closed down, they moved overseas, whatever the case might be, and so they get funding from the Department of Labor to get retraining so that they can go into additional careers, and colleges get support through these grants to, to redesign programs to support these students who often have very low skills, who often are your adult learner populations and therefore could benefit from these um, extra supports through adult ed. Just a little bit about state policy supports. Um, so each of the states realizing that while the, the federal government has a lot of interest and focus in, the area, in this area, it doesn't necessarily always come with a lot of money. Um, and so they're also looking at what can we do to support the efforts that are happening on the ground. And so there are a number of uh, state policy innovations that are happening to support these programs. I'll just point out a couple. A couple. The state of Kansas just par uh, passed what they call the GD accelerator legislation. Um, basically, it supports integrated pathways uh, with accelerated GD attainment um, uh, in adult ed. It also provides um, performance based incentives to programs that help their students get the GED more quickly, that also stay with those students until they get a credential, and, um, and they also help to pay for the GED test itself. So they're trying to, to remove whatever barriers they can, but also foster some innovation. Other examples, um, North Carolina has this Basic Skills Plus initiative. They allow uh, community colleges to use 20% of their state state match for adult ed funds to support integrated pathways. So 20% of those adult ed funds can be used to pay for occupational training for those students. Again, these are state level funds, not federal level funds, um, but it's a great way, again, of addressing the tuition and fee challenge. Um, another quick example is that uh, per the Illinois Community College System is aligning Perkins funding with integrated pathways. So this is, we can't pay for tuition, but we can pay for the instructors, we can pay for the st supportive services, we can pay for a number of the supports. And um, this is a big deal because Perkins has often been kind of in a black box and, and many institutions don't even know how their Perkins funds are used. Um, and so this is a way to use them more creatively, again, in support of these programs and students. And, and even though it's not a, a state policy effort, I did want to mention the Houston Community College um, when with their board of trustees, because I think it's so great, that college, which is um, one of the largest in the state of Texas, has five campuses, and they have an integrated pathway program there. They got their board of trustees to pass a tuition re reduction for students in integrated pathway programs. These are students who, who do not have a GD or a high school diploma, who come into the program, to the college, they're in GD prep that's contextualized and accelerated, and they're in occupational training at the same time. And per credit hour, um, students were paying uh, about $100. Um, and, and they got the reduction, to uh, the tuition reduction, they pay now about $20 per, per credit hour. So for now, less than $100, um, a student can actually get an occupational credential who didn't have a GD or high school diploma. So that's just, just um, a fabulous example of taking something, piloting it, tracking the data, showing success, and then making the case for additional resources as a result of that. Okay, my alarm just went off, so I'll just say a, a little bit about teaching and learning. So there's a lot actually um, happening in the field right now around something called deeper learning or student-centered learning. Um, and you know, we're really great about giving things little catchy names, um, but this work is really focused on how do we make the learning as student-centered as possible, um, as competency-based as possible, uh, having students learn not only in the classroom but outside of the classroom, and, and having students exert on ownership of their learning. They are building the self-efficacy to learn more, to pose their own inquiry questions, to do the kind of critical thinking and analysis that they need for college and for careers. Um, the good news is that many of you do that already in adult ed. 
a lot of this effort is coming actually out of K-12 and working with some of the uh, middle and high school students. And when we looked at that, you know, those of us who work on the adult team said, hey, we do that already. Um, and so maybe you all could learn something from us about that. Um, and so we started talking about where adult ed is actually already addressing these key uh, tenets of student-centered learning. You're already doing differentiated instruction and paying the needs, uh, special attention to the needs of particular populations like English language learners and, and the need to align um, oral language development with uh, written language skills, um, comprehension of written language. Uh, we, we talk about um, out-of-school youth, or what they now call opportunity youth, who, are, uh, who need extra support around figuring out what their career pathway options are um, because they make decisions about what they want to pursue like this. What are you going to study? Okay, I'll do that too. You know, as opposed to any kind of objective review of what are the opportunities out there and what are my interests and how do those line up. So they need a lot more support. Um, and the peer connection is, is, as you can see, really essential for them. So we, we pay attention to that in our work. Competency-based education is at the heart of what you do as adult educators uh, through uh, contextualized teaching and learning strategies, through prior learning assessments, which are increasingly becoming important um, as, as folks are being, as adult learners are being asked to demonstrate what they know um, and can do and are, are able to get credit for that. And then a lot more focus on competency-based instruction, um, not only in terms of the content, but also in terms of the delivery methodology. Uh, having learning take place anytime, everywhere, because you focus a lot on real world learning. How do students apply these skills, these academic skills in the real world? You're already doing that. Um, and you can do that even more as you integrate this with particular occupational pathways. And then, as I mentioned earlier, having students build their own self-efficacy, -effic having them focus on their own inquiry. Uh, we worked on a small project funded by um, NASA with a few, a few community colleges that was focused on integrating, it was, it was focused on teaching STEM skills, you know, the science, technology, engineering, and math skills, uh, critical thinking, analysis, um, all of that. And, uh, and it was focused on community colleges, but we had one adult ed provider uh, who was part of one of the colleges that was uh, engaged with us, and we were so excited about that. And they were taking climate change uh, content, NASA creates um, you may not know this, but there are lots of satellites out there pulling down lots of data about everything um, as it relates to the Earth and its systems. And so utilizing that in teaching students these skills, lots of data to do rich analysis. And so the students started coming up with their own questions about their own communities and were able to explore that um, in their classes. So I would love to talk with you um, at some point, uh, clearly not now, uh, perhaps later in the follow-up session, there's a lot of assessment that goes along with these new uh, teaching approaches. And I was disturbed to hear in a, in a session that we held in a place I will not disclose that, uh, that many folks are not doing enough assessment. You know, they do a big kind of diagnostic at the beginning, and then they do a post test at the end, and they might have some quizzes here or there, but really, they're not using this, the assessments that they do do in very rigorous ways to help them understand how their students are performing. Um, they're not using that to change the way that they're providing their instruction if their students are not performing well. Um, they're not using it to motivate students. It's just really kind of a check a box that says, I did that. The, the wealth of different types of assessment, you know, which we could get into a conversation about, um, but these are kind of part of the student-centered learning approach is that you have a variety of types of assessments that serve multiple purposes, and we're just not seeing it happen um, in a lot of places. And so I'd love to talk with y some of y'all about how you see this happening in your own institutions and organizations, or it could happen, or um, to, to really better understand how your students are doing. So with that, I, I just want to leave you with, uh, and I, I threw out a lot of information, um, was not able to go into much depth about it yet, um, but I, again, I invite you to come to the follow-up session in just a few minutes. But if you are not able to do that, I just want to leave you with some uh, uh, ideas about where to start. So the first is to assess yourself. Um, where are you 
uh, against these three strategies? What are you doing to connect the services that you offer to career pathways? Are you providing any kind of career exploration or information about employment demand to your students so that you can counsel them effectively? Are you building the bridges that they need to successfully um, enter into and complete um, occupational training or enter into a career, um, or even if it's training on the job? Are you, are you partnering with post-secondary institutions to create these accelerated, integrated pathways that help students get uh, a GED and an occupational credential at the same time so that we're not continuing to foster these very sequential, long models that many of our students don't persist in completing. So it's good to, to take a moment to assess yourself against these strategies. And then figure out where you want to be. Everybody doesn't have to do the same thing, but we all need to do something in this area of career pathways. And then figure out who do you need to partner with to help you build the programs that you want to implement based on the goals that you have for the services you want to offer around career pathways. And there are a number of strategies for, for making these connections with these stakeholders. Some of them are in some of the resources that I mentioned to you and provided uh, URLs, um, you know, web addresses to. Others we can talk about in, in a follow-up conversation. But most importantly, I just want to also remind you that data is the currency of the realm. Those who are effective in the work that you're doing and can demonstrate that effectiveness will be those that attract partners, will be those that attract resources, including funding, um, and will be those ultimately that can help your students be successful in, in getting the careers and the quality of life that they really want. So thank you so much for this opportunity to share. I hope this was helpful.